So God's timing and our timing has to come in different ways. Could I read that? We serve an infinite God. There is no beginning and there is no end to Him. We are finite. Really and truly, He kept giving us grace after grace, mercy after mercy, and we keep going back to the crap that we're supposed to let go of. The thing is, you can't access it if you're not practicing the things of the kingdom. Like I was telling you in group yesterday, you can't live a life in hell and expect the blessings of the kingdom of heaven.
and they got a double portion of the punishment that they were supposed to, to receive. And it's when this morning in Isaiah where God had mercy on them. He, he, he let down everything and comfort, comfort, comfort ye my people, comfort. And he brought them back to that place where I will take you back. You will be my people once again. And this morning, my brothers and sisters, God wants to be your God. And I'm not talking the figurative thing that we come to church on a Sunday and expect, you know, the, the right response. He wants to be your God because hear what he's saying. I have been patient with you. And in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, the Lord is not so about his promise because, you know, um, sometimes we ask God for things that God says yes. That's one of his answers. But in our time, how do we expect his the yesterday? The answer is supposed to come when? Right now. Not so? And if it don't come now, God is studying me. God forget me. He know I am not on God's agenda anymore. If it doesn't come, no. And what tends to happen, my brothers and sisters, and this is what God is, and he's, he's, I'm really wrestling with this because it's like, if it doesn't come now, yeah, well, God, fine. You do your thing, I will figure out my stuff. And that's our attitude towards God moving forward. Because God's timing in verse 9, it's not 8. In verse 8, do not be ignorant of the fact, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like one day. So, God's timing and our timing are two completely different measures. Could I bear that? We serve an infinite God. There is no beginning and there is no end to Him. We are finite. We are really finite. So, to us, everything must happen now or else I will miss out. Not so? Yes. Um, there's this thing called FOMO, fear of missing out. Right? And God is saying, listen, take your time. Take your time, but don't drag your foot. Let, let, let me bring that again. Take your time. But don't drag your foot. Because hear what is happening. Every single one of us has an assignment from his kingdom to deliver on this earth. Amen. And the thing is, we have these expectations of God that is unrealistic. God is, we, in other words, what he's saying, let me put it in his exact words. You come to me and expect things to happen right now, but I am not your God. I am an addition to your agenda. He is, is he that just an addition to our agenda? Because he said, I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. He's just supposed to do everything for you one time. Not so. We don't have a process of becoming anymore. And God is saying, I am being very patient with you. Because the assignment that I gave you, it is important for my kingdom. But because things don't happen the way you expect it to happen, you lock me off. Kind of like the children of Israel, not so? You lock me off because things don't go your way, in your time, in the way you expect it to happen. And then, when we get sickness, when problems happen in our lives, we complain, you're coming and complaining to me. Why? You never accepted me wholly in your heart anyway. And God is saying here this morning, my brothers and sisters, we need to change the way we think about God. Because he has been very patient with us. I mean, when you read the Old Testament, the persons who we, 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 we see as powerful, mighty men and women of God, you know how many times God says in Scripture, I have to kindle my wrath against them? And you know what I mean? He had to kindle his wrath against them. Why? Because again, just like 
every one of us, they want things their time in to do things their way. And God is like, who, who is in charge here? If you have solely given yourselves to me, who is in charge here? And God wants to be your God. Tell somebody next to you, he wants to be your God. And if we continue in the way that we're doing things, my brothers and sisters, we are going to end up in trouble. Because it says, but the Lord is not slow about this promise as some think of slowness, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish. Man, I, huh? <laughs> I am so glad God doesn't operate with us the way he operated with the Israelites. But if you think about how we operated with the Israelites, we are going to, we would have been, probably we may not have been existing right now. Because he really disciplined them. And some persons would say, but God was that the, the angry stage of God in the Bible. That's why God was dealing with people bad. No. Really and truly, he kept giving us grace after grace, mercy after mercy, and we keep going back to the crap that we're supposed to let go of. And God is saying that I face in you a piece of my kingdom for you to deliver here on earth and then drag in your foot and play the fool with it. Why? Because you have allowed the enemy to get into your mind and your mind is now creating the future that you don't want for yourself. I'm talking to anybody here this morning. I'm doing something like that for a minute. But you are creating the future that you don't want. And what is he talking about? In my kingdom, there are certain elements that are very important. When, when Jesus left, he gave us the Great Commission. That's all. Go into all the world and preach the gospel and everything that goes there with it. Hallelujah. The thing is though, that journey is supposed to create in us the character of the kingdom. What are the, characters, the characteristics of this kingdom I'm talking about? The love, the joy, the peace, the fruits of the spirit. Is that evident in your life? When people see you, do they run to you or turn the way and run the opposite direction when they see you coming? Are they joyous in your presence? When they look at your faces, do, do you light up their day? Or do you bring the rain even more? Are the characteristics of God's kingdom present in your life? What are we what are we actually doing when we when we talk about church? Do, do we just come here as well and we listen to us more? This is this is what we do. What is happening on our Sunday morning? Turn up the doors on TV. Is he the same thing that played over and over on cable? Yeah? So we will come to church and we will sit down. You will listen for an hour, hour and a half, two hours max. But no. And I will show up for this book and the rest of the day. Where is God? Where is God? Where is your assignment in this whole thing? Where are the characters of the kingdom being practiced in your life? And God is saying, I am being patient with you. I am being patient with you. But hear what? Just now, guys, Two weeks ago, we had the preacher a, a message. The time is coming. The time is coming when those same gifts that I gave you, if you don't use those gifts, you will be in trouble. Because here, what the scripture says, right? The gift that I gave you will make room for you. So, one, you take away our excuses for not being able to, to live a healthy life based on the gifts that He gave us. Because hear what? If your gift will make room for you, that means it will also ensure that you live a healthy life. In other words, you'll make sure your finances is in order. 
any successful person, when you look at them, or even have a conversation, read their books, whatever it is, you will find out that all of them function in their giftings. All of them. They function using their gift. And if the world could function effectively, become successful using their gift, how different are we? Can we do the same thing? No, the answer is alright. Can we do the same thing? Because the reality is, when you realize that you put some effort behind your gift, you, you, you actually see something happen. And you're like, whoa, I didn't know I could have done that. It wasn't me. It was God. And this week, actually, I heard a story. A man died. And the angel, when he went to heaven, the angel took him on a tour of a particular mansion in heaven. And the, the mansion was filled with a lot of treasure and gifts. And he asked the angel, why are you bringing me to show me all of these things? He said, the angel said, um, these were yours. You just never accessed them. You just never accessed them. All of them was yours. But you never accessed them. How many of us have treasure being stored up in, in the kingdom that we want here good right now? Not so? Yeah. We could do it it now, not so sister. Right? We could do it it. The thing is, you can't access it if you're not practicing the things of the kingdom. Like I was telling you in group yesterday. You can't live a life in hell and expect the blessings of the kingdom of heaven. When you accepted Christ, you were translated from the kingdom to all the nourishments of the kingdom of darkness that you were getting before. It is now taken from you because you are translated into the kingdom of light. It's just like a transplant in a plant. When you move it from a, a bucket and put it in the ground, what is the first thing that happens? It loses its leaves. Not its leaves, not so. It looks like it is dying. And then what happens? You spring back up. Because they were asking a question. Why is it that when you decide to serve Christ, things just get harder? I say it don't get harder, it gets better. You have to understand where your nourishment coming from. Where is your nourishment coming from? Because in the kingdom of darkness, Satan is going to ensure that he gives you everything else so that you will not need God. When you come to the temple and you get locked into that lifestyle, you don't need God. But here what happens is when you're looking good, He takes it away from you. How oh, do I function now? You take away everything that like being who I am, my status, you take away the friends and the who I thought I had, and everything that was going good for me, you take it away. Then, you know, it's when we, when we reach close to the end, we come into the kingdom of heaven and expecting things to just happen just so. But you still have to go through the process. You still have to shed the leaves. You still have to go through the pain, as I call it, growing pains for the kingdom that you're in now. How many of us have already gone through the growing pains for the kingdom that you're in? No answer. Because yes, it is going to be difficult. But anything worth anything, guys, it's difficult. Anything of value, as we realize, is uphill. There has to be that struggle. That struggle must take place. If it doesn't take place, it's too small. Trust me, you're not in heaven. You're not in the kingdom that you think you're in. If the journey, guys, is too smooth, look at yourself. Ask yourself the question, why is it everything comes so easy for me? If it is too easy, you are in problems. You are actually being nourished from the kingdom of darkness. And I'm not saying this to make you feel bad. I'm just, I hope I'm holding your eyes. 
anything worth anything is uphill and it is difficult. Yeah, man. I, I got to the point where I just expected it's a bad mindset after letting that go, right? But you know, you, you expect things to go wrong. And I've learned why things are going wrong, God is actually trying to teach me a lesson. Amen. Isn't it? Yeah? You can't, exactly. It has to be rough. If you, everything, guys, cannot be easy in life. Everybody has to go through those great things. Let me continue with this today because I can that for Verse 10 says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. Has anybody here a thief ever called and said, Come to mind tonight? No. No, it will never happen, right? They will just appear. And the same thing that's going to happen with when Jesus comes. Nobody knows when he's going to come, but for sure we know one thing. He's coming. Right? But here it is. And then the heavens will pass away with a loud noise. Now I want to give us some context here. Because Paul uses those um, cosmic language because in those times, that's what the Gentiles were talking. Right? That, so he used a lot of cosmic language, elements, and this and that and the other. But simply saying that when Jesus comes, the heavens will pass away with a loud noise. In other words, the things that we hold so dear to us, the important things, you know, the, the status and all of the, the, the trappings of life, it's going to come now. It's going to crash. That's right. It is going to crash. He's going to bring it down with a loud noise. So you're going to, to, to realize a change in pause. Hello? There's going to be a change in mindset that he needs when he comes. Because you know what? The kingdom of heaven is not what we experience here on this earth in terms of our governments. Am I correct? And the elements will be dissolved with fire. What are the elements? That's the mindset of this world. You know, the principalities, the things that people, um, you know, that goes against the grain of the Bible. Anybody know what I'm talking about? That, 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 that it's okay for men and men to be together, and women and women to be together. Yeah? Those elements that we hold so high, the value system of this world that we hold so high. You know, if you're going to certain environments and you talk about sexuality, everybody cheering you on. You say you're a Christian. No longer held of any kind of value. But the things of this world, they are held high. And God says that when Christ returns, all of it is going to come down. Every high thing must come down. And the earth and everything that is done on it will be disclosed. So he's going to reveal truth to us when he comes back. That's why the scripture says in Isaiah, a voice crying out in the wilderness, make his play path straight. So he's going to make it straight. He's going to uncover for us everything that was hidden about who you are. The treasure that is within you, he's going to reveal it to you and show you your truest potential. Because right now, we're not functioning with our full potential. We are functioning based on other people's perception of who we should be. And the mindset that we have accepted from others as to how we should live. And we are hiding God's gift within us because nobody else said doing that. Who else is see doing that? At the end of the day, God is going to ask what you did with my son. And that's the treasure that's in you. What did you do with it? Well, Lord, um, nobody else was doing it by my church. Uh-huh. Um, Lord, I didn't know how to. Mm -hmm. Some sounds like plausible excuses. Yeah? Mm -hmm. No? It's not plausible. <laughs> 
Hear what? At the end of the day, the Bible says that whatever you need to know, you can learn it from them. Everything that you need to know about what's in you, you can learn it from the Bible. So we have no excuse as to how to access the gift that is in us and use it for the building up, building up of his kingdom. Now, let's say you have been doing that. All well and good. Now, the third question. Who are you teaching to develop this? Who are you helping to become better than they think they are? Who are you helping to pass you? God is speaking to us this morning, Christian friends. What are you going to do? Are people going to find us still faithful to Him or following the world? What are they going to find? The next generation to come, are they going to find us still faithful and speaking positive into our life and into our church? Then, if no is the answer, we need to do something and do it now. Because what we're actually saying, therefore, is that Christ died in vain. That his sacrifice was in vain. And God has been so patient with us to get it right. Why? Because it is his wish that we all come to repentance. Come, get it right this time. And every single day, we have an opportunity to get it right. A new start, a new beginning, a new 24 hours to get it right. Can we commit ourselves to getting it right with God this morning? Can we commit ourselves to changing the thought process that the world has told us is what you should have? And what you should be adopting. Because this morning I'm like, I listened to that candlelight and um, script and I was like, wow, yes. We have accepted too much of the world's philosophy in our hearts and in our lives and we live it out expecting God to bless it. No, it will not be blessed. Why? It is not from his kingdom. We can do better. And it starts one step at a time. I'm not saying one when they elaborate thing to tie out yourself and kill out yourself. But start small. And let him guide that process. Will it be easy? No. I promise you it will not be easy. Will it be worth it? Yes. It will be worth it. So let's take that journey. And just as when the disciples were sent out into all the world, they went in pairs. Don't try to do this by yourself. Find someone who you know they are there in their faith. They are where you want to be. Find someone to help you along that journey. Because if you try to do it on your own, the devil will mash you up. But as the Bible says, we're two or three. You just need two. Two to start with. And then let it build from there. God will send workers in his vineyard to ensure that the crops, they are nourished, they are taken care of, get the right fertilizers and everything so that it becomes strong. And he has given you the authority over this vineyard. Don't be like the, 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 um, the wicked renters, as you call them, yeah? and destroy the servants of God. Because you think they're supposed to be born, and they're supposed to go this way. But just open yourself up to God, and let Him do His work in you. Amen?